Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Abington Launchbox Techumentary series as we track, trace, and tell stories about uh, some of our everyday tech and how it kind of got to be that way. So we're going to have some fun looking at some of this vintage tech, thanks in part to my colleague, producer, and co-host of today, Derek Majors. So Derek, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk about some of this stuff. Uh, it's a huge passion of mine to learn about this stuff and uh, to use a lot of it too. Um, and uh, we've gone as far back as we really can um, as far as physical examples. <laughs> That's right. And, uh, and it was kind of fun for me, at least, going back through some of the things in my basement, pulling out some things. Some of these things are from when my father was actually a child, well, not maybe a child, but a very young adult. So it's, it's really cool to see all this out in front of us today. And we're going to talk about the history of things. First episode that we're in today, we're talking about storage media, how it's evolved and how innovation has played a role in changing not just the forms, the functions, the usability, the durability, the portability of all these things. Uh, so thanks again uh, to Derek, our host and producer of the show for helping organize and establish this. Let's stop talking about it. Let's do it. <laughs> Where do you want to start, Derek? Where do we get the, the ball rolling with storage media? Sure. So uh, we're starting way back with um, tape reels. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen these in movies used to represent old computers, those large towers with the two spinning yep. um, reels of tape in them. Um, to, re to sort of represent that, uh, we have uh, audio tape today. Yeah. Um, uh, not data, computer data tape but um, a reel of audio tape. And uh, what Peter's holding now, also uh, an audio cassette. Yeah, so audio cassette is one level of, the concept is there's magnetic media, and you'll be able to see it a little bit easier. This is this is actually an audio reel, um, but as Derek mentioned, if you've seen, uh, they're not even old movies, they're movies from like my childhood, like uh, War Games with Matthew Broderick. Uh, I remember that, that there's, you know, the computers in the background, you see the giant wheels in the back spinning. It's the same concept, just in a larger format. So a wider tape, bigger reels. And we're gonna talk about why, why things needed to be that way. But ultimately, uh, this is what, what was happening uh, in computers. What time frame? Like when was this stuff happening? Sure, so yeah, I mean, um, everyone's ever heard of IBM. Uh, they introduced uh, magnetic tape, uh, using magnetic tape in computers um, in the 1950s. Um, they replaced punch cards and um, they went anywhere from uh, five megabytes to 140 megabytes per 2,400 feet, four, 400 feet by the 70s. Right, so we're talking almost a half mile um, <laughs> to get five megabytes up. I mean, 140 megabytes though isn't all that small when you think about what um, what was happening in that that time frame. The the file size wasn't that big, and you know, forgive us. I don't remember a time before magnetic media where it was punch cards. I'm aware of that. But we're kind of starting at a point where we can get our hands physically on some of these things. But um, so even just this this cassette, uh, if you look at the, the back of this box, I just saw this, it has 1,200 feet um, of magnetic material here. So, you know, you're talking uh, a couple megabytes possibly on, on something like this. Now, again, this was, um, this is actually from 1961 is the recording uh, date that's on this. But uh, talk to me, like what, what made this innovative, moving away from punch cards and moving to this, this tape-driven media format? Like what was the innovation that happened from that prior stage to where we got to with this magnetic media? Sure, so um, you're moving from, you know, holes in paper, uh, very fragile, doesn't last very long, um, to uh, strips of plastic coated with um, iron dust, basically, uh, magnetized in different ways to store uh, ones and zeros used in computer programs. Um, and uh, it was much faster. It was much more durable. Mm. And um, yeah, those are the and, and it could store, you know, you know, far more data. And it was much less more time, much less time consuming. Uh, yeah, but that portability thing and the durability. But I mean, thinking about stories of having, you know, boxes of punch cards and if any of them got out of order out of sequence <laughs> the entire processing could have been uh, completely dismantled and i couldn't imagine having to go back and resort all of those punch cards into the right into the right sequence to make it happen so this really brought uh, a little bit more usability to to computing 
Yeah, not to mention uh, probably one of my favorite anecdotes in computing history. Um, the term, uh, I'm not sure if this is totally correct, but this is how the story goes, is that the term bug in computer code uh, was from literal bugs that would um, cover up or um, have the computer misread punch cards. Interesting. I, I, did not, punch I did not cards. know that. And whether it's mythology or reality, it's a, it's a really interesting story of how some of our terms even get innovated by the technology that we use. All right, so how do we move forward? I already showed a little bit of you know what's next in the stage, but as we evolve beyond this or, or innovate beyond this, I should, I'm should i gonna try to use that word innovate because really what we're having a discussion about is innovation in action told through the stories of things. And, and again, Derek, uh, as our producer, is the one that really came up with this idea of, I think there's lots of great stories that can be told. You just told a great story about where did the term bug come from, whether it's myth or fact, not sure that I care. It's a really cool story and one that I will probably use over and over again. Mm -hmm. So as we move from tape reels, what's next in, in that innovation sequence as we go? Sure. So um, as you can see, um, inside of a cassette tape is plastic tape. Um, and uh, so the big innovation here was um, making it more portable and durable, uh, making it more well suited for personal computing use. Uh, it was introduced uh, throughout the 70s and 80s. Um, right here is an audio cassette, but um, people use data cassettes to store things like computer programs or large um, large amounts of data for their computers. Um, and it just made it more accessible to the general public. They didn't need large towers right. that held look, giant spools of tape that could be easily damaged yeah. uh, through transportation. Yeah, and I would imagine also just the, the setup, right? So as you talk now about usability and particularly personal usability and not just um, office or uh, government usability you know the, the ability to change a, a cassette because it's compartmentalized became much easier than you know coming off the end of a spool rewinding putting it onto an end just became much more um, user friendly mm -hmm. and, and i think that's a one thing the other thing obviously is the durability now things are semi-contained you're not going to wind up having uh, 1,200 feet, or what we talk about, 2,400 <laughs> 2, feet um, of, of tape. Could you imagine that? You turn on the computer, like, why is it starting slow today? And you go and you're like, oh, man, I missed a connection point on the other, on the, you know, collecting reel. And now I've got a quarter mile of tape on the floor that i got to figure out how to re-spool. Yeah. So I, I, I like that. And, you know, again, we, we just didn't have any specific data cassettes, but similar concept just portrayed through audio uh, formats in this version. We'll talk about these again when we talk about audio uh, as we go through our series. We've got a couple other electronic stopping points, including audio technology. Mm -hmm. All right, moving forward. Yeah, so uh, moving forward is, um, you know, uh, very, a very um, important uh, yeah. thing, just like we were saying how uh, cassettes uh, made personal computing possible. Um, the industry was exploding and um, in the 1960s, an eight inch variant of the floppy disk uh, was developed. And um, that was very, that had a lot of industrial applica applications. Uh, what's way more well known is the five and a quarter inch variant that I'm holding here um, that uh, stored anywhere from at the beginning of its life to uh, 360 kilobytes to 1.2 megabytes. Yeah, and that, that's where I got introduced to um, computing is in that era. Uh, so if that gives you any idea of my age, that's where that's where it started for me. And it, it might seem like a very different f thing, almost a completely different being. But uh, Derek, it's basically uh, the same thing as we were dealing with mag magnetic tape in the real to into the real to real format. This is just the the same thing in a different uh, direction size. Exactly. So you can see that familiar uh, magnetic tape color uh, right here in this little window. Um, it's simply in a different form factor. Instead of tape, uh, it's a disk, uh, which meant that um, sectors of the disk and data could get access much quicker by computers. Um, maybe it wasn't quite up to snuff uh, with the amount of data it could store just yet. But uh, like I said, that changed as the years went on. But um, yeah, much faster, um, much more easier to transport and store your files quickly. Absolutely. And, and again, thinking about if you have to move from one section of code to another, having to back up a, a you know half mile of of actual media versus now uh, a disk head moving 
uh, linearly across um, this this flattened version of it. Still the same thing. It's still magnetic material on a plastic mylar uh, material. Uh, so we do we didn't really have to change all that much, but just that move. I, I think the biggest thing is the the speed, the the ability to access different sectors of that data more rapidly. Exactly. Just like Peter said, you'd have to uh, rewind to one end of the cassette or the other. Um, I'm sure for those who've used audio cassettes, getting back to the first song of the track or the, on, of the album, uh, you know, it took a long time and that's exactly how long it took to access data on the other end of the track. But um, with floppy disk, it was a lot easier. Yeah. And let me just share one one thing about what what I think happened with with this, this disk. Um, it, it's still a bit fra fragile. Um, it's definitely floppy. But one of the things is it's really super durable compared to what we were using before. And that durability really made it accessible. So I, I still remember as a young boy, um, I would go to a bookstore. They actually had stores and they had books inside of them and magazines. Um, but there was, uh, when I was young, there was some PC magazines and you would get a magazine. It would talk about different coding things, different programs. Uh, but one of the things that I loved is it would come with uh, a floppy disk and that would have some interesting little programs that I could then take home and play games, do drawings and things. And what was amazing, and I didn't really think about it until Derek put this um, techumentary series together, is the durability of this allowed it to be mass produced, literally stapled to the inside of um, the cover of a magazine shipped all over the country. And now think about how you could disperse things like video games and programs compared to where we were before. You could now, this made this much more shippable, sendable, shareable. And, and I think that was a really big value yeah. that, that came from this. Especially this this five and a quarter inch floppy disk um, was the, uh, you know, came at, a time, came at the perfect time to really usher in a whole new market um, right. for computers. And that was the personal computer market. Uh, absolutely. And uh, yeah, just like Peter said, um, everyone, had programs on these things. Uh, they were they were very uh, easily distributable, and um, that really helped thing helped kick off uh, you know the notion that you could have a computer to That's yourself right. or in your own home. Right. I mean that that whole term term PC. Right. You know we asked do you, do you have a PC or a Mac? PC seems it doesn't even mean anything, but that this is where it meant something. Personal computing, and to me this is this floppy disk is where personal computing became a reality. It was still incredibly expensive. It was still niche, but I think the, the pathway was unlocked with this innovation right here. Yeah. In fact, this specific floppy disk uh, was my mother's when she went to college um, and it was meant to, uh, you know, store assignments uh, that were written on a uh, one of several computer terminals on our campus. Uh, and notice how I didn't say computer because these were simply mm. terminals that yep. could access the campus's computer. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so I think that kind of illustrates how at the time that they came out, um, it was really not common for no, people to it, have it, their own computers, but uh, over their lifespan, that's cool. it all changed. Right. So it might not seem like much, but we moved a little bit more forward. It didn't take all that long, but we, we stepped into, um, I'm gonna say iconic for a reason because if you've ever hit the save button on many different products, it looks like a thing. And that thing is right there. The yeah. three and a half inch floppy disk. So this was introduced in uh, 1982. Uh, it started its life as 720 kilobytes uh, and uh, moved all the way up to 1.44 megabytes, which is uh, the most popular um, amount of data to be stored on one of these. Um, and it's uh, a lot more durable and compact than um, the five and a quarter inch disc. Um, and as you can see, uh, if I move this, that little black stripe in the middle is the magnetic disc. Uh, so it's still using the exact same technology, just more dense and um, in a smaller and more durable form factor. And everything we said about the five and a quarter inch diskette um, applies here, much more durable, more easily distributable. Uh, and this is when home computing really kicked off and everybody had a computer. In yeah, it, it really is the, the point. And, and truly, there, there's a reason why it is the icon uh, for many save files is because this this was how we, we save things. And uh, 
you know, this is what I was saving files on in college. Now you're, you, you don't even need anything. We're, we're into the cloud. We'll get to that point in storage media. But uh, what was amazing is being able to toss this into a folder or even just into the bottom of your book bag and it worked. And you could, you, these things would work for years. Um, that durability level really is what I think was the main innovation here is we, we now took magnetic media on plastic to a level where it was portable, um, it was affordable, and it was ultimately durable enough that uh, PCing at the home became a very reasonable and, and doable thing in the 80s. Yeah. Um, now, moving on uh, to sort of the modern day. Um, yeah. We have uh, what many might not recognize or um, may not even, if they do recognize it, may not recognize the similarities it has to the floppy disk uh, is the modern hard drive. So um, inside of this enclosure is actually a spinning disk. And uh, while it's not made of plastic, it's made of different material, um, it still stores data magnetically. And um, here is uh, a variant that goes in a lot of laptops. Um, and uh, they've been in development since the 1960s. Uh, they caught on in the 80s due to um, improved technology. Started out as around 10 megabytes to 20, uh, and, and now in modern day uh, can go up to 20 terabytes. <laughs> so pretty staggering uh, leap in the last you know, couple decades. Um, but uh, these were a lot flap faster than floppy disks uh, and could store a lot more. And um, yeah, it's still used very much the same technology in a different form factor. Um, and uh, often coexisted with floppy drives. Yeah, but, that's right. Yeah. 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 I mean, right. So traditionally, uh, computers had a C drive, which was typically the internal hard drive, which contained uh, a lot of your boot files, your operating systems. And then you had an A or, or B drive, which was your um, insertable media and at that point was was usually this and the reality is you're right you you might because you don't see the hard drive often i don't know that you realize that it it's the the exact same idea just um amped up right so we we added um you know again more data more speed but still spinning media being read by a track head that moves linearly across that that space uh, and it really was was something to see how much stuff we can put on there now. I mean, these are still things that we use. You can go into any store right now and buy a, a, a physical media hard drive, uh, and you're going to be able to store a lot of things. Not as fast access as some of the new uh, materials that we're going to mm -hmm. get to in a minute, but still as far as cost per quantity that you're able to save, I got to tell you, these these hard drives are still probably fairly relevant if you're looking to store lots of material affordably. As long as you don't need to access it super quickly, yeah. they're not bad. Still very much in use today. Yeah. I know uh, when I uh, built my new computer recently, um, I included both, uh, you know, the hard drive and uh, flash storage. Yeah. Uh, just because it's, it's still very uh, cost effective. Right. Uh, storage. Yeah, and, and I will tell you, um, as we record this video for the Abington Launchbox, uh, it got stored. Uh, we process everything on solid state drives and flash drives and uh, SSD cards. Uh, but once we're done formatting all this, all of the archive files, we're on a three camera setup now, everything gets archived onto uh, a traditional hard drive like this. And I think that's very much an industry standard. Yeah. Uh, lots of prof professionals uh, do the exact same thing. That's good. I'm not a professional, as you can tell. <laughs> but uh, we, we try to play one on TV or at least YouTube as we're here today. So what's next? Where are we going? Sure. So uh, you talked briefly about um, removable versus non-removable media. Oh, yeah. uh, the hard drive being uh, permanently inside the computer and the floppy drives being removable. Um, so the hard drive may have a lot of advantages over the floppy drive, but it is not removable. Yeah. So uh, next we're going to be talking about optical media. Cool. Um, so that is CDs and DVDs. So the CD was released uh, in 1984 at a capacity of seven, 700 megabytes. So a lot um, <laughs> in those times. Yeah. Um, much faster than a floppy disk um, and had an absolutely huge capacity and became the um, you know go-to removable media for storing items. Uh, here we have uh, so we a have CDR. Both. We have a CDR. Sorry, my hand is over it. 
which is uh, stands for <laughs> get this right eventually. <laughs> uh, which is a CD you can uh, write data to, and a CDRW uh, that came out later because of um, erasing technology. So RW stands for rewritable. Um, as well as uh, we have two DVDRs here. Um, this one actually has a computer operating system on it. Oh yeah. Um, and um, it is 4.7 gigabytes. Yeah. So DVDs came out later. Um, but uh, yeah, just a huge jump in um, storage capacity and speed um, in the removable media world. It, and it was, and and again, I, I that's about the time frame I was I was finishing up college, moving from 1.44 megabytes to 700 megabytes is massive. I, I mean, you're, I don't even know, I can't do the math on that, but let's say 400 <laughs> times is what we're looking at. And that's, that's a monumental leap forward in how much stuff you could save on, on the things. But this is really also a, a major innovative leap. We still have physical media, we still have it spinning, we still have a, a, a reading head moving across that linearly, but there's a big innovation here, which is now we move to digital uh, content, right? So now we're, we're picking up optically, we're reading information, not from an analog magnetic medium, but we've now moved into a digital optical medium. And that is where you got that massive leap forward from 1.44 megabytes to 700 megabytes, all the way up to a DVD now, 4.7 gigabytes. Um, and, and this also ushers in a whole new era of computing as we start doing more things digitally, which is then the springboard for all the stuff that's about to come as we, we go through the next few iterations of this innovation sequence. Absolutely, as well as uh, just in the media world alone, uh, the jump in quality, uh, picture quality, music quality, um, just, you know, space. <laughs> yeah, and that's really what it comes down to, particularly when you're dealing with video is just the amount of space that gets taken up is is uh, monumental. There were still some challenges with these, particularly durability. So uh, if you had these and maybe you left it in your car upside down, sometimes the um, the medium in here would kind of craggle and break up and that's it. Uh, they are not particularly flexible. So if anything happens, they can break. Uh, and I can <laughs> I told you I was not I'm not a professional. So there, there you have it. I just dropped the breakable media. Yeah, I certainly have a lot of memories. Um, <laughs> Hopefully not on that. Uh, disc. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely have a lot of memories of, um, you know, trying to get my video games to work, especially yes. a lot of video games are stored in optical media. Um, you know, that's a great point. I hadn't thought about also just the ability, you know, back to the bug story about having uh, particles and dust that um, could literally uh, refract the light that the optical reader was trying to pick up. And therefore you have a glitch and yeah. no game today. Yeah, I remember a lot of times uh, <laughs> trying to rub off scratches and, and uh, trying to get games to work. Yep. And uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, you may remember also blowing in cartridges. Oh, yeah. uh, we'll definitely touch upon that in our video yeah. game uh, episode later. Yeah, good. So we're, we're again, just as a quick reminder, we're uh, Myself, I'm Peter Hornberger. I don't think I've even introduced myself. Uh, Peter Hornberger from the Abington Launchbox and uh, joined by our uh, producer and co-host of the Techumentary series on innovation through vintage tech, where we're talking about uh, the innovations, how they emerged, and hopefully actually seeing, touching, and feeling those innovations in action. But uh, as you watch, if you have comments, things that we should be talking about, we do have more uh, episodes in the series, audio, video, and video games are coming soon. But if you have comments, thoughts, add them into YouTube. That's what we're here for. We'd love to hear what your thoughts are and what we might be missing. What's next? So uh, you just discussed uh, digital media, yeah. the, that massive jump and uh, what it meant. So um, going from optical now to flash storage. So one of the first flash media um, is compact flash. Uh, these survive today in general use uh, with um, mainly cameras and photography, um, but um, for they were first released in 1994 uh, and can be anywhere from two megabytes at the beginning of their life uh, to around 512 gigabytes today. Um, here I have a 512 megabyte example and a 64 megabyte example. <laughs> 
um, which were a lot more common than 512 gigabytes. Um, and uh, really the huge thing here was that flash uh, was the fastest uh, method of data storage. And also um, you're finally rid of damaging your media. Yeah. Uh, if you, you know, move a mag, a magnet past your floppy disks yep. or get a scratch on your optical disk. Um, that's a thing of the past. Also skipping if you have a portable media player. Um, and uh, so now we're in the world of, of just uh, incredibly fast and durable storage. Yeah. And, and again, I think is, is we, what we hope we're, you're seeing is we look through and map these innovations where we're kind of having common sequences where we add either portability, durability, speed or capacity. But most of the time we don't innovate all of those things at once. Most of these things are innovating on one, possibly two of those things. But you can really see how if you're an innovator trying to make these quantum leaps where you're going to to innovate on three or four different pathways at the same time probably isn't really the way you you can do it. It, it seems to be we keep adding function on maybe one level first and that takes us to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing but compact compact flash was this huge moment of uh, being able to be on the move ca have data and made everything a bit more rugged so talking about photography just being able to take a picture and have that media be written to a disc while you're climbing a mountain, while you're doing all kinds of things, and it leads us to things that we're, we're going to use today. Actually, this camera right there is a GoPro, which wouldn't be possible if we had to write to optical media because you would have movement. I hope you would have movement exactly. in your GoPro. Yeah, so I mean, cool. GoPro marketed as an action camera. Yeah. Um, you would never be able to get any sort of uh, images of any sort of action without uh, flash media, cool. definitely. So what are, what are some of the other iterations? So that in that same kind of package, there, there's been a lot of adjustments to that. And, and we've got a couple examples to show of, of how we kind of innovated and evolved through that, that compact flash and, and ultimately uh, get down to the next levels of SD cards and uh, micro SD cards. Sure. Um, and this is true for a lot of the formats discussed today. Uh, in between, there are a lot of different formats that aren't as successful or uh, aren't as standardized. Uh, one of those formats, uh, before we get to the well, very well-known SD card, uh, in 1998, Sony uh, released the memory stick. Um, this is a four megabyte example. And um, yeah, like I said, there's a lot of different formats. Um, some of you may have heard of zip disk, which was the, uh, the antagonist to the much more popular floppy disk. Um, but uh, yeah, moving on to the SD card, uh, released just one year after the memory stick. Um, this could store up to two terabytes in modern day. Uh, this is 32 gigabytes. Um, and um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this. Uh, this was used in, I, I don't know, tons of things now. Lots of things. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and again, that format standard versus uh, the Sony memory stick, which was um, manufacturer proprietary. And it seems like that might have been the way to go at some points where you're from a business perspective, you're trying to create the ecosystem, uh, but at least in forms of memory, it seems like the universal formats like the SD cards really seem to be the thing that um, we're all going towards. Uh, and that's where you've seen Sony's memory uh, stick fall off, if you've even seen one of them at all, <laughs> um, and moved into these, these common formats all the way down to um, what we're recording on today yeah one of these and uh that is the micro sd card uh introduced in 2005 um and uh you can go on amazon right now and buy a one terabyte uh version of this and uh <laughs> now that we're at the end of our journey here today yeah uh, we'll compare just how absolutely ridiculous um yeah the uh the difference is yeah it, it is it really is amazing when you think about um you know uh less than a megabyte uh, or five megabytes of content on a, about a half mile of media um, versus a terabyte on um, something that uh, is sometimes is too small. Uh, and, and to be very honest, that, that's one thing that I want to also discuss as we continue down this road. Is there a point where you just take it too far? And now if that um, SD card, the micro SD card gets any smaller, 
what are you going to do? How do you actually get it out of there? How do you how do you move it around? Um, and how many of them are we going to lose because they're so small? Yeah, I think um, I think that sort of segues us into the very last thing we'll talk about today, um, which is the solid state drive. So that is the um, like we talked about non removable versus removable uh, storage medias. Um, that is the you know older brother or yeah younger brother to the hard drive. Um, it uh, was first uh, shipped in 1991 at a capacity of 20 megabytes, mm. um, but the largest capacity today is uh, available to consumers is 100 terabytes. So, um, and that's where I think you know uh, maybe for removable storage, this is the size at which it stops. Yeah. But um, if you can get even smaller than this, uh, it doesn't matter if it's non-removable. Um, you know, you just bake it onto the circuit board. Right. And uh, that's I think you're right. Sky's yeah. the limit for that. But yeah, now that that uh, the SSD is the most standard non removable storage today. And um, yeah, 100 terabytes in something that is uh, I want to say a similar size to this. My SSD at home is about that large. Yeah. Yeah. And they're there. You know, even if you have a portable one, it's going to look something like this and about this size. But if you actually break it down, what's actually in there it's, is exactly what Derek was talking about. So if you have a portable SSD drive, it seems like manufacturers are saying, let, let me make it big enough <laughs> so that it still is tangible and you can actually pick it up because the actual media itself is, is so small that you, you don't even need a big package for it. But it's helpful, uh, at least it's helpful for me to make sure that I don't lose it and it seems more substantial. But mm -hmm. the the evolution size of of capacity, but also uh, speed, right? So one of the major I think advantages of an SSD drive is the speed that the data can be accessed, and and what that enables you to do again is run more robust programming, um, higher levels of data transfer, and uh, so if you're using that for things like capturing content now it makes things possible like 4k video where you're you're bringing in massive amounts of of uh, data per second and and that is something now that's going to unlock lots of things like uh, 8k virtual reality 3d whatever's next holograms holographs it doesn't matter there's so many exactly. more things that we can do yeah with each uh just like we talked about with the uh floppy disks with each of these innovations each of these huge leaps uh, it gives um, different markets the chance to explode in popularity and, uh, you know, just be simply possible. Great. So wraps us up for our storage media program. We wanted to start with this because this really is at the heart of so many other innovations. So as we get into the coming episodes in our Techumentary series, we're going to be talking about visual media, including things like GoPro cameras. We're going to be talking about audio recording and audio media and all the way down to video games and seeing how uh, you had Xboxes and PlayStations using this. And now we've evolved to things that are coming uh, streaming content, downloadable content, cartridge content still from Nintendo and the Switch. Storage media really is the thing that allows the other innovations to be built around that. And I think that it's to me, again, it's so uh, rewarding to be able to just pick up and hold some of this technology in my hands and, and uh, remember the times that I've used these things. Um, this is actually probably one of the first things that I ever recorded my voice on uh, was an old reel to reel set at my house. And we want to share those stories with you as we continue. We also invite if you have comments, things you want to share your stories, Use the YouTube platform for what it is, which is uh, a place to come and watch and, and engage with videos. But that engagement also allows you to drop some comments. We'd love to hear about some of your experiences with any of the things we talked about today and even the things we might have forgotten to talk about because we'll come back. We'll make more episodes. Anything else you want to finish us off with, Derek? Uh, just that uh, thank you for tuning in. And uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to sort of share uh, what I'm really interested in and what I'm passionate about, uh, which is a lot of this old vintage technology and uh, you know, the journey and the story of uh, how we got from then to now. Cool, thanks all. We'll see you next time on another Abington Launchbox production.